E. Junto presents The Apology by Plato. Plato's second most famous work after the Republic, The Apology gives the account of Socrates' trial and sentencing. Though it is impossible to tell how much of the Apology was actually spoken by Socrates, the account does follow the outline of Xenophon, who also attended the trial. In any case, the work provides a valuable image of Socrates as viewed by his pupils. How you, O Athenians, have been affected by my accusers, I cannot tell. But I know that they almost made me forget who I was. So persuasively did they speak. And yet they have hardly uttered a word of truth. But of the many falsehoods told by them, there was one which quite amazed me. I mean when they said that you should be upon your guard and not allow yourselves to be deceived by the force of my eloquence. To say this when they were certain to be detected as soon as I opened my lips and proved myself to be anything but a great speaker, did indeed appear to be most shameless, unless by the force of eloquence they mean the force of truth. For if such is their meaning, I admit that I am eloquent, but in how different a way from theirs. Well, as I was saying, they have scarcely spoken the truth at all, but from me you shall hear the whole truth. Not, however, delivered after their manner, in a set oration duly ornamented with words and phrases, No, by heavens, but I shall use the words and arguments which occur to me at that moment. For I am confident in the justice of my cause, or I am certain that I am right in taking this course. At my time of life I ought not be appearing before you, O men of Athens, in the character of a juvenile order. Let no one expect it of me. And I must beg of you to grant me a favor. If I defend myself in my accustomed manner and you hear me using the words which I have been in the habit of using in the Agora, at the tables of the money-changers, or anywhere else, I would ask you not to be surprised, and not to interrupt me on this account. For I am more than seventy years of age, and appearing now for the first time in a court of law, I am quite a stranger to the language of the place. And therefore I would have you regard me as if I were really a stranger, whom you would excuse if he spoke in his native tongue, and after the fashion of his country." Am I making an unfair request of you? Never mind the manner, which may or may not be good, but think only of the truth of my words, and give heed to that. Let the speaker speak truly, and the judge decide justly. And first I have to reply to the older charges, and to my first accusers, and then I will go on to the latter ones. For of old I have had many accusers, who have accused me falsely to you during many years, and I am more afraid of them than of Anatus and his associates, who are dangerous too in their own way. But far more dangerous are the others who began when you were children, and took possessions of your minds with their falsehoods, telling of one Socrates, a wise man, who speculated about the heaven above, and searched into the earth beneath, and made the worse appear the better cause. The disseminators of this tale are the accusers whom I dread, For their hearers are apt to fancy that such inquirers do not believe in the existence of the gods. And they are many, and their charges against me are of ancient date, and they were made by them in the days when you were more impressionable than you are now, in childhood, or it may have been in youth, and the cause when heard went by default, for there was none to answer. And hardest of all, I do not know and cannot tell the names of my accusers, unless in the chance case of a comic poet. All who from envy and malice have persuaded you, some of them having first convinced themselves, all this class of men are most difficult to deal with, for I cannot have them up here and cross-examine them, and therefore I must simply fight with shadows in my own defense, and argue when there is no one who answers. I will ask you then to assume with me, as I was saying, that my opponents are of two kinds, one recent, the other ancient and I hope that you will see the propriety of my answering the latter first, for these accusations you heard long before the others, and much oftener. Well then, I must make my defense, and endeavor to clear away in a short time a slander which has lasted a long time. May I succeed, if to succeed be for my good and yours, or likely to avail me in my cause. The task is not an easy one. I quite understand the nature of it. And so leaving the event with God, in obedience to the law, I will now make my defense. I will begin at the beginning, 
and ask what is the accusation which has given rise to the slander of me, and in fact what has encouraged Miletus to prove this charge against me? Well, what do the slanderers say? They shall be my prosecutors, and I will sum up their words in an affidavit. Socrates is an evildoer and a curious person who searches into things under the earth and in heaven, and he makes the worse appear the better cause, and he teaches the aforesaid doctrine to others. Such is the nature of the accusations. It is just what you have yourselves seen in the comedy of Aristophanes, who has introduced a man whom he calls Socrates, going about and saying that he walks in air, and talking a deal of nonsense concerning matters of which I do not pretend to know either much or little. Not that I mean to speak disparagingly of anyone who is a student of natural philosophy. I should be very sorry if Miletus could bring so grave a charge against me. But the simple truth is, O Athenians, that I have nothing to do with physical speculations. Very many of those here present are witness to the truth of this, and to them I appeal. Speak then, you who have heard me, and tell your neighbors whether any of you have ever known me hold forth in few words or in many upon such matters. You hear their answer. And from what they say of this part of the charge, you will be able to judge the truth of the rest. As little foundation is there for the report that I am a teacher and take money. This accusation has no more truth in it than the other. Although if a man were really able to instruct mankind, to receive money for giving instruction would, in my opinion, be an honor to him. There is Gorgias of Lentonium, and Prodicus of Cius, and Hippias of Elis, who go the round of the cities, and are able to persuade the young men to leave their own citizens, by whom they might be taught for nothing, and come to them, whom they not only pay, but are thankful if they may be allowed to pay them. There is at this time a Perean philosopher residing in Athens, of whom I have heard, and I came to hear of him in this way. I came across a man who has spent a world of money on the sophist, Callias, the son of Hipponicus, and knowing that he had sons, I asked him, Callias, I said, if your two sons were foals or calves, there would be no difficulty in finding someone to put over them. We should hire a trainer of horses, or a farmer probably, who would improve and perfect them in their own proper virtue and excellence. But as they are human beings, whom are you thinking of placing over them? Is there anyone who understands human and political virtue? You must have thought about the matter, for you have sons. Is there anyone? There is, he said. Who is he, said I, and of what country, and what does he charge? Avinus the Perean, he replied. He is the man, and his charge is five mania. Happy is Avinus, I said to myself, if he really has this wisdom and teaches at such a moderate charge. Had I the same, I should have been very proud and conceited, but the truth is that I have no knowledge of the kind. I dare say, Athenians, that some one among you may reply, Yes, Socrates, but what is the origin of these accusations which are brought against you? There must have been something strange which you have been doing. All these rumors and this talk about you would never have arisen if you had been like other men. Tell us, then, what is the cause of them, for we should be sorry to judge hastily of you. Now I regard this as a fair challenge, and I will endeavor to explain to you the reason why I am called wise and have such an evil fame. Please to attend, then, and although some of you may think that I am joking, I declare that I will tell you the entire truth. Men of Athens, this reputation of mine has come of a certain sort of wisdom which I possess. If you ask me what kind of wisdom, I reply, wisdom such as may perhaps be attained by man. For to that extent I am inclined to believe that I am wise, whereas the persons of whom I was speaking have a superhuman wisdom, which I may fail to describe, because I have it not myself. And he who says that I have speaks falsely, and is taking away from my character. And here, O man of Athens, I must beg you not to interrupt me, even if I seem to say something extravagant for the word which I will speak is not mine. I will refer you to a witness who is worthy of credit. That witness shall be the god of Delphi. He will tell you about my wisdom, if I have any, and of what sort it is. You must have known Cherophon. He was early a friend of mine, and also a friend of yours, 
for he shared in the recent exile of the people and returned with you. Well, Cherephon, as you know, was very impetuous in all his doings, and he went to Delphi and boldly asked the oracle to tell him whether, as I was saying, I must beg you not to interrupt. He asked the oracle to tell him whether anyone was wiser than I was, and the Pythenian prophetess answered that there was no man wiser. Cherephon is dead himself, but his brother, who is in court, will confirm the truth of what I am saying. Why do I mention this? Because I am going to explain why I have such an evil name. When I heard the answer, I said to myself, What can the god mean, and what is the interpretation of this riddle? For I know that I have no wisdom small or great. What then can he mean when he says that I am the wisest man? And yet he is a god and cannot lie. That would be against his nature. After long consideration, I thought of a method of trying the question. I reflected that if I could only find a man wiser than myself, then I might go to the god with a refutation in my hand. I should say to him, Here is a man who is wiser than I am, but you said that I was the wisest. Accordingly, I went to one who had the reputation of wisdom and observed him. His name I need not mention. He was a politician whom I selected for examination, and the result was as follows. When I began to talk with him, I could not help thinking that he was not really wise, although he was thought wise by many, and still wiser by himself. And thereupon I tried to explain to him that he thought himself wise, but was not really wise. And the consequence was that he hated me, and his enmity was shared by several who were present and heard me. So I left him, saying to myself as I went away, Well, although I do not suppose that either of us knows anything really beautiful and good, I am better off than he is, for he knows nothing and thinks that he knows. I neither know nor think that I know. In this latter particular, then, I seem to have the slight advantage of him. Then I went to another who had still higher pretensions to wisdom, and my conclusion was exactly the same whereupon I made another enemy of him and of many others besides him. Then I went to one man after another, being not unconscious of the enmity which I provoked, and I lamented and feared this. But necessity was laid upon me. The word of God, I thought, ought to be considered first. And I said to myself, Go I must to all who appear to know, and find out the meaning of the oracle. And I swear to you, Athenians, by the dog I swear, for I must tell you the truth, The result of my mission was just this. I found that the men most in repute were all but the most foolish, and that others less esteemed were really wiser and better. I will tell you the tale of my wanderings, and of the Herculean labors, as I may call them, which I endured only to find at last the oracle irrefutable. After the politicians I went to the poets, tragic, dithyrambic, and all sorts. And there I said to myself, you will be instantly detected. Now you will find out that you are more ignorant than they are. Accordingly, I took them some of the most elaborate passages in their own writings and asked what was the meaning of them, thinking that they would teach me something. Will you believe me? I am almost ashamed to confess the truth, but I must say that there is hardly a person present who would not have talked better about their poetry than they did themselves. Then I knew that Not by wisdom do poets write poetry, but by a sort of genius and inspiration. They are like diviners and soothsayers, who also say many fine things, but do not understand the meaning of them. The poets appeared to me to be much in the same case, and I further observe that upon the strength of their poetry, they believed themselves to be the wisest of men in other things in which they were not wise. So I departed conceiving myself to be superior to them for the same reason that I was superior to the politicians. At last I went to the Artesians. I was conscious that I knew nothing at all, as I may say, and was sure that they knew many fine things, and here I was not mistaken, for they did know many things of which I was ignorant, and in this they were certainly wiser than I was. Delivered after their manner, in a set oration duly ornamented with words and phrases, No, by heavens, but I shall use the words and arguments which occur to me at that moment. For I am confident in the justice of my cause, or I am certain that I am right in taking this course. 
At my time of life, I ought not be appearing before you, O men of Athens, in the character of a juvenile order. Let no one expect it of me. And I must beg of you to grant me a favor. E. Junto presents The Apology by Plato. Plato's second most famous work after the Republic, the Apology gives the account of Socrates' trial and sentencing. Though it is impossible to tell how much of the Apology was actually spoken by Socrates, the account does follow the outline of Xenophon, who also attended the trial. In any case, see by the force of my eloquence. To say this, when they were certain to be detected, as soon as I opened my lips and proved myself to be anything but a great speaker, did indeed appear to be most shameless unless by the force of eloquence they mean the force of truth. For if such is their meaning, I admit that I am eloquent, but in how different a way from theirs. Well, as I was saying, they have scarcely spoken the truth at all, but from me you shall hear the whole truth. Not, however, de if I defend myself in my accustomed manner, and you hear me using the words which I have been in the habit of using in the Agora, at the tables of the money changers, or anywhere else, I would ask you not to be surprised, and not to interrupt me on this account. For I am more than seventy years of age, and appearing now for the first time in a court of law, I am quite a stranger to the language of the place. And therefore I would have you regard me as if I were really a stranger, whom you would excuse if he says the work provides a valuable image of Socrates as viewed by his pupils. How you, O Athenians, have been affected by my accusers, I cannot tell. But I know that they almost made me forget who I was, so persuasively did they speak. And yet they have hardly uttered a word of truth. But of the many falsehoods told by them, there was one which quite amazed me. I mean when they said that you should be upon your guard, and not allow yourselves to be dis 